Hello, this is a lecture on uh, gear trains. Gears are used to change the speed or torque of a rotating element. We will look at properties of gear pairs and gear trains. And next semester, we will look at the forces involved and look more closely at sizing a gear for a particular need. So how did gears come about? Well, initially, um, there were just rolling cylinders. Um, we have an example here of an external set of rolling cylinders and an internal set of rolling cylinders. Um, of course, there would be a problem with these, um, namely, they could slip on one another. So even though these, the bigger and the smaller cylinder are rotating on one another, uh, because there are no teeth involved, right, these aren't gears, these are just smooth cylinders, they could slip. And so while you may be rotating the big cylinder here, you'd have instances in time where the smaller cylinder was not rotating at all because it was slipping, right? Um, there's also internal sets. In both of these cases, the um, distance between the axes of the rolling cylinders is dependent upon their radii. And of course, their radii also um, control the ratio of their angular velocities. Now, after this, we also have um, belt drive systems where still you get an angular velocity difference uh, between the two things attached, between the two rotating um, pulleys in this case. But the benefit of this system is that the distance between the axes is independent of the radii of these pulleys. But still, even in this case, you could have slip, right? And so you could be rotating this small pulley, and because the belt slips on the pulley, the big pulley might not be rotating at all, depending on how much slip there is, right? And so the disadvantages of the rolling wheels and the belts are that the, the torque capacity is low, because if you try to put a lot of torque through the system, you'll just get slip. So the slip potential means they can't be used where an exact relationship between the input and output is required. Okay. So to prevent slip, we can add teeth. If we add teeth to the cylinders and belts, we get what is called gears. Right? And so here's that case. Right? So here's an external gear set where now instead of rolling cylinders, we have gears. And so we have these little teeth cut into each. Right? And you see here the rotation of the directions. Right? And so one gear rotates clockwise, whereas the other rotates counterclockwise. This brings us to the fundamental law of gearing. The angular velocity ratio between gears of a gear set remain constant throughout the meshing process. And so what we mean by that is that as these two gears rotate, let's say for example, this uh, bigger gear has a radius two times that of the smaller, right? Then that would mean that the smaller is rota rotating twice as fast. So it's a two to one ratio but it's not 1.8 to 1 or 2.1 to 1. It's always 2 to 1. No matter when you start looking at it, you'll always see that one gear, the pinion, in this case is smaller, is rotating twice as fast as the bigger one, and it doesn't fluctuate as the gears rotate. Um, the angular velocity ratio can be calculated. Its um, variable is m sub v, and it's the angular velocity of the output divided by the angular velocity of the input gear. This is also equal to the radius of the input gear divided by the radius of the output gear or the diameter of the input gear divided by the diameter of the output gear. The negatives here are for the case when there is an external gear set and that accounts for the case of one being clockwise and one being counterclockwise. We don't usually worry too much about the negative signs. However, we we'll just say that the gear ratio is two to one or three to one. What we won't say is that it's like um, uh, negative 3 to 1, right? Um, if it's an internal set, then it's R in over R out or D in over D out. Of course, they've removed the negative sign because for an internal set, the angular velocity ratios are the uh, directions are the same. The torque ratio is the inverse of the angular velocity ratio. So the torque ratio is omega in over omega out. Okay, so that's the opposite of what we saw here, where we have omega out over omega in. And let me just change my uh, one second here. I think it'd be better if I used a, a laser pointer. You can more easily see what I'm pointing at here. Okay. So torque ratio is the um, inverse of the angular velocity ratio. And that's the most important thing to remember there.
Okay. Now, a little bit about gear tooth nomenclature. And so here we have the large gear and the small gear, the pinion. Okay. And you can see that where the teeth meet, they kind of have these curved surfaces of each of the teeth. All right. And there's a common tangent. And so where the teeth happen to meet at this point in time is called the pitch point right here. And right through that point, tangent to both teeth is the common tangent. Perpendicular to that common tangent is our axis of transmission or line of action. This is the common normal. It is tangent to both base circles. Now we'll get to the base circle in a second. There's also a pressure angle, right? The pressure angle phi is that angle between a line drawn straight perpendicular here, or I should say straight vertical here through the pitch point and the axis of transmission, okay? And I think that's everything on this particular um, page that we need to focus on, okay? And so uh, continued a couple of other things that we'll look at here um, in terms of the gear tooth. We have a pitch circle, right? The pitch circle is the surface of the rolling cylinder before we added teeth. And so this is where, if we were just using rolling cylinders, they would be, this would be the outer edge of one of those rolling cylinders, the pitch circle, right? And then the base circle is the radius measured from the center of the gear to the axis of transmission. Okay, and so here's the base circle. And again, we talked about the axis of transmission on our previous slide here, right? We had this axis of transmission here, right? right? And so um, the distance from the center of the gear to the axis of transmission is the base circle, right? And there's our axis of transmission, again, right here, perpendicular to the common tangent, okay? Okay, and our addendum. The addendum is the amount of tooth that sticks out above the pitch circle. So here's our pitch circle, and we have this addendum amount, right? The amount of that the tooth sticks out above the pitch circle. Okay. And so those are three items that um, I want you to remember, the pitch circle, the base circle, and the addendum, and a few, and three more. So our tooth th thickness is the width measured at the pitch circle. So the width of the tooth measured at the pitch circle. The tooth space width is measured at the pitch circle slightly larger than the tooth thickness. So the space width is measured also at the pitch circle, but it's between two places on the tooth, right outside that tooth uh, thickness, right here to here. Now, this distance is going to be a little bit bigger than the tooth thickness. The difference in the two is the backlash, which we'll see more about on the next slide. The face width is this dimension here, how thick the tooth is or how thick the gear is. It's measured along the gear axis. So the circular pitch is an arc length. Um, along the pitch circle from the position on one tooth to the same point on the next tooth. So our circular pitch is, goes from here to here, okay? So that's different than the space width, right? So the space width is just this width of this opening here at the pitch circle. But if we take any point on one tooth and go to that same point on another tooth, then that's our circular pitch. So again, the backlash is defined as the clearance between mating teeth measured along the circumference of the pitch circle. Generally, there will be a small difference between tooth thickness and space width, okay? So what that means is as follows. Backlash, if you, some of you may have uh, seen this before. If you hold one gear and keep it from rotating, and you take the other gear that's mated with it, you can usually wiggle it back and forth a little bit. That's because the space width is a little bit bigger than the tooth thickness. Does this matter in practice? Well, it depends. If you have a very, um, a very precision uh, apparatus where there's a lot of back and forth of one gear causing another gear to, to move back and forth, then backlash is going to be a problem because when you stop moving in one direction and go back to move in another direction, that little gap, because the space width is larger than the tooth thickness, is going to have to be taken up before that going backwards contacts the tooth again. Right? So as long as you're rotating in the same direction, you won't really notice backlash. But if you stop and go back the other direction, then you will notice kind of some, some back and forth wiggle room that you have on one gear while the other gear is not moving. Okay, continuing with gear tooth nomenclature, the PD is the diametral pitch or the number of teeth divided by the pitch diameter. The module M, which is an SI unit, is the reciprocal. And here you see 
Uh, this was a printout from a gear catalog, and you see as the module number gets smaller, your gear teeth get a lot bigger. Uh, the velocity ratio is um, m sub v and is equal to plus or minus and again this is because of the internal versus external gear sets is the diameter of the input gear divided by the diameter of the output gear this is also equal to the number of teeth on the input gear divided by the number of teeth on the output gear so again n is related to the number of teeth and so we're used to dealing with I think most people are used to dealing with R the radius and D the diameter in terms of gears but you can also look at the number of teeth and the torque ratio m sub t is the inverse of the velocity ratio right so we just get D out over D in and N out over E in now when we talk about gear ratio we're going to take the max of those two numbers now they're reciprocals of one another so for example let's say the angular velocity ratio is, is 4 to 1 then the torque ratio is 1 to 4 so you could say the angular velocity ratio is 4 whereas the torque ratio is 1 fourth or 0.25 we'll always take the larger of the two when we talk about gear ratio because most people aren't so concerned about if you're uh, concerned about going from smaller to bigger or from bigger to smaller they just want to know what is that ratio so in this way the gear ratio will always be bigger than one we'll never have a fractional gear ratio so in other words you won't say that your gear ratio is one-third or 0.333 you will say your gear ratio is three right? the contact ratio or MP the average number of teeth in contact at any given time this is equal to the length of action divided by the base pitch where Z is found from um, the previous equation 9.2 um, the number of teeth in contact and so you look at the smaller gear and the bigger gear how many teeth are contacting at any given time now the average number of teeth I'm sorry in contact at any given time if the average number is one then that's bad Okay, because if only one tooth is in contact at any one time, and that's the average, that means there's going to be times when no tooth is in contact. So we don't want this because a slight error in the tooth cutting process or the manufacturing process would, would result in an MP less than one, and in which case we'll get jumps in the velocity as contact shifts from one tooth to the next. Also, that means if just one tooth is in contact, that the load on the tooth starts at the tip of the tooth right and so creating a large bending moment a greater chance that a tooth will break okay. we desire an MP greater than one means we have a period where two teeth are in contact at the same time this is a better distribution of the load right so an MP between one and two means at certain times all load will be carried on one tooth however in that case it will be not at the tip but in the center of the tooth lower on the tooth right in the center of the mesh so the the bending moment won't be as large the minimum MP for smooth operation of gears is 1.2 we desire 1.4 or greater the smaller the teeth the larger the pressure angles but that will give us a larger MP okay give us a larger MP so smaller teeth and larger pressure angles will give us a larger MP now gear types spur gears this is the most popular type of gear the teeth are parallel to the axis is the simplest and least expensive gear to make but it only works if the axes of the gears that mate together are parallel a helical and herringbone gear right so a helical has a helix angle so instead of the tooth going straight across as in the spur gear there's an angle and that angle is called the helix angle the herringbone gear simply takes two helical gears of different angles right opposite angles and puts them together right so the herringbone gear ends up being a more expensive gear than the helical gear because really it's almost like two gears having two gears um, stuck together Helical gears can either be right or left-handed. The opposite handed are used when the axes are parallel. So in this case, you see opposite hand gears you use a right and a left put together so that the axes can be parallel. The same handed are used when the axes are at an angle. Helical gears tend to be quieter and stronger than spur gears. So whereas the spur gear, you have that, that whole tooth coming down and 
and smacking against the other two all at one time, creating kind of this clacking sound, right? The helical gear, they come more to a gradual contact so you don't have that, that, that slapping sound that you would have otherwise. Um, and they're stronger because the, um, the load is distributed along a, lar a larger section, right? The spur gear, the, um, the gear is, uh, the tooth goes parallel to the axis, and so there's less length um, for the tooth uh, in a spur gear. Cross axis helical gears, the helix angle can be designed to accommodate any skew angle between nine intersecting shafts. And so here we see almost probably, this is, looks like almost a right angle between these two gear axes. Herringbone gears are formed again when two, using two helical gears of identical pitch and diameter but opposite hand. This cancels the axial thrust load. Okay, so with a normal situation for a helical gear, because the teeth are at an angle, part of the thrust is going to cause that gear to want to slide down the axle that it's on. Right? So if you put two together and create a herringbone gear, then one pushes one direction, the other pushes the other direction, and so they cancel each other. So you don't have it wanting to walk down the shaft. But again, it's going to be more expensive than a simple helical gear. Worm and worm gears. So the worm has only one tooth. Here's our worm. It has only one tooth, just kind of going around, on, and around, and around, right? Wrapped a number of times, kind of forming a screw. The gear is the worm gear. So this creates a very high gear ratio, right? And so while you might have 25 or 30 teeth on one gear, you only have one on the other. So that's a 30 to one. They must be installed carefully, but it cannot be back driven. So what we mean by that is that the input cannot be switched to the opposite gear. So in this type of setup, this is your input, right? And so you turn the worm, and when you turn the worm, the gear turns. In this case, the gear would be turning very, very slowly as you turn the worm. You can't do it the opposite way, so you can't turn the gear and have the worm turn, right? So it's not back drivable, um, because just as the ratio could be a 30 to 1, the friction is also multiplied by 30 times. And so when you try to reverse it, you have a lot of friction you have to overcome, and you cannot overcome that and cause, cause the um, worm to turn by rotating the gear. The rack and pinion is one of the gears. Uh, one of the gears is straight, line, or rack in which case here's your rack, right? Um, it transfers uh, between rotary and linear motion, but it requires a, bake, a break because it's easily back driven, like you can easily drive uh, the uh, gear and cause the rack to move, but then of course you can push on the rack and cause the gear to move, which means you reversed it, which means you've back driven it, and back driving it is very easy. So if you didn't want it to be back drivable, you'd have to use a brake so that you wouldn't be able to push the rack and cause the gear to rotate. Bevel gears, their axes intersect. Okay, so another gear type. And as you see, well, this is a, this is a mismatch, right? And so you won't have this situation, but this is how you set them up. And so they come together at a point, right? And here's another idea for um, a bevel gear where the axes will intersect. Okay, so here's an example of a straight bevel gear. Again, here's one axis coming up through here, another axis coming through here, and so they write, they connect or intersect right about here at a right angle in this particular case. Hypoid gears, axes are non-parallel and also non-intersecting, okay? And so here we have a wheel axle. As an example, a hypoid gear would be used in a vehicle, right, where this is coming from the motor, this is the input drive shaft, and here is the wheel output shaft gear. And so the interesting thing about this one is that the axis coming through here and another one axis coming through the center here, those axes are non-parallel and they do not intersect as they did in the previous cases. And so if you go back to some of our previous gear sets, right, these axes, um, well, the axes here are actually non-parallel, but um, let's see here was an example. Uh, here we have parallel axes. Um, here we have, in this particular case, non-intersecting um, shafts, non-intersecting axes. Um, in this case, our axes do intersect and they're not parallel. Okay, And in this case, they are not parallel and also not intersecting. I'm sorry, in this case, they are intersecting even though they're not parallel. In this case, they are non-parallel and also not intersecting. 
I'm sorry, I got a little confusing. I jumped around a bit too much. Um, simple gear trains. Intermediate gears don't count. Okay, and so here's what we mean by that. The velocity ratio for this gear train is calculated as, as follows. The input, again, we're doing angular velocity ratio, mv. So the input number of teeth divided by the output number of teeth. So the input number of teeth on, in, uh, on this gear, the second gear, we always start with the second gear. There's never a first, there's never like an N1, right? We always start with two, and that's just convention. So the input number of teeth divided by the output number of teeth on the first set. And in the second set, this gear, gear three becomes the input. So the input number of teeth divided by the output number of teeth. So that's this one. And then the next set, this is the input and in, in five is the output. So in four and five and then last in five is the input and in six is the output in five or in six. So if you look at these, if all these ends rep represent the number of teeth on that particular gear, then you'll see cancellations, right? So in three cancels, the N4 cancels, the N5 cancels, so you get N2 over N6. And so what happened to all these intermediate gears? We could have just put N2 on top of N6. You could say the only benefit that we have is we have a separation between the axes of a pretty decent distance, right? But the fact that we included these intermediate gears did not change our angular velocity ratio. So when we see a simple train like this, to find the angular velocity ratio, only thing we have to do is say the input uh, number of teeth divided by the output number of teeth. For larger ratios, let's say greater than 10 to 1, we need to use a compound gear train. Okay, So a compound gear has two gears fixed together so they rotate as a single unit on the same shaft. And So here is one of those types of gears, right? And so this, we have two gears rotating together on the same shaft so they'll have the same angular velocity ratio. So here's our input rotating, change, going to this output, which is also turning in four as the input, which turns in five as the output. And here's another way of drawing it. So we have the input, in this case, turning uh, uh, counterclockwise, and that's gonna make uh, in three turn clockwise. In four is also gonna turn clockwise, which is gonna turn in four in five counterclockwise. Compound gear train. So if we want a very large gear ratio, this is how we do it. The gear ratio for the previous compound train, again, input over output. So N2 is the input, N3 is the output for the first set, so N2 over N3. And for the second set, N4 is the, out, the input and N5 is the output, so N4 over N5. And so you see no cancellations here because N3 and N4 are different numbers of teeth. And so we're able to get a compound train. So in this case, the angular velocity ratio is N2 times N4 divided by N3 divided by N5. So for a general gear train, the product of the number of teeth on the driving gears divided by the product of the number of teeth on the driven gears. So we haven't changed our equation. It's just that we're not getting the cancellations that we got for the simple train. So general gear train equations also work for simple trains. Okay, And so again, all of our inputs divided by all of our outputs, but we get cancellations with the simple train. And so we just end up with N2 over N6. How do we design a gear train for large ratios? So let's say our ratio is 180 to 1, right? A very large ratio. So to design a compound train for a ratio of 180 to 1 with no gear set greater than 10 to 1, because a lot of times we'll say we don't want any set to be greater than 10 to 1. We don't want some, you know, 11 inch gear and some one inch gear, like some huge difference, right? We want to keep these gear sets a little bit closer together. So, um, and in this case, we don't want any gear with fewer than 12 teeth. So how do we go about that? Now, the first thing you do when given a goal for a train is you take that number. It's always going to be something to one, right? 180 to one in this case, right? Actually, that second number can be sometimes something different. I'll show you how to deal with that. But in this case, 180 to 1, we take the square root of that. And we see, is that greater than the 10 to 1? Because remember, we want every set to be less than, uh, well, no set greater than 10 to 1. So we take the square root. That would be two sets, but we get 13.4. So that's bigger than 10 to 1, so we don't want to stop there. So then we take the cube root, and we find that that's 5.6. That's less than 10 to 1, so we stick with it. Now, if this number was larger, 
we could keep going and we might find that we need five sets before we get down to something less than 10 to 1. But in this case, our cube root produces 5.6, meaning that we can develop this gear set with three sets of gears, three sets. Okay? So three sets is going to mean um, three input gears and three output gears, three total sets. Okay? So now we then need at least three gear sets if we want to limit the ratio of each set to 10 to 1. Next, we try to find an integer ratio that gives us 5.646, assuming the pinion gear has at least 12 teeth. Again, remember, that was one of our requirements, right? We wanted every gear to have no fewer than 12 teeth. So what we do is we take this cube root number, the 5.646, and we multiply by 12, 12 being the smallest number of teeth that we could have, meaning that if our small gear, which is often called a pinion, if that gear has 12 teeth, our large gear will have 67.75 teeth. Now, that's a little weird, right? We can't have a gear that has less than a whole number of teeth, right? So here, we need a three quarters of a tooth, okay? So we're not gonna have that. So we jump up to 13. So 5.64 times 13 gives us 73.4. Mm, still not good. What about 5.646 times 14? Well, that's 79.05, so that's getting pretty close to a whole number, right? And then 5.646 times 15, again, 84.69 or 84.7, not as good. So 14 and 79 is pretty close, so let's see what we get there. So if we use a train of three sets, each having 79 teeth on one gear and 14 teeth on the other gear, or the pinion, the gear sets give an overall ratio of 79 divided by 14 cubed, or 179.68 to 1. Well, that's very close to 180 to 1. That's only 0.2% away from 180. So if we're doing this as a problem, let's say as a homework problem or a problem at work, the question would be, what was the allowable error in our gear train? If the error was anything less than 0.5%, then this is just fine, right? Now, if the error was something smaller, what would we have done? Well, we go back to this chart, and we continue to increase our number of pinions until we got to a number where the remainder was less than the 0.05. That's, that would be what we would do, especially if we were not looking for an exact 180 to 1 ratio, right? but some error was allowed. Now, if we need exactly 180 to 1, then we need a different approach. Okay, and so what we do in that case is we do factors. We factor the 180. So 180, the factors are 2, 2, 3, 3, and 5. And so what we're trying to do with these factors is form three groups, right? And so here's one example, 6 to 1, 6 to 1, and 5 to 1. So we did 2 times 3 as one of the sets, 2 times 3 as the other set, and then 5 to 1 as the last set. Or we could do 9 to 1, 10 to 1, and 2 to 1 or 4 to 1, 9 to 1, and 5 to 1. All of these are going to produce exactly 180 to 1, right? So which one should we pick? Well, since our requirement is to stay bigger than, I'm sorry, smaller than 10 to 1, I would not pick the middle one. So then it would be between 4 to 1, this last one, and this first one. I think this one would be the best choice because look, first of all, two of the sets are equal meaning that the gears that we pick for them will be the same, right? So that's great because now if one is damaged or becomes worn over time, we're replacing, it's almost like the, the repair, the, the gears we need to keep on, to, on the side for repair will have fewer different ones that on the side that we need to keep, right? Or if we're, we're marketing this and, and selling it, then we're able to buy more gears that are similar, meaning that we'll have lower costs, right? Also, these gears are closer to the same in terms of their ratio than these, right? So there's a few things that make the first set preferred. Now, if we look at it, none of these, well, six to one is not the number of teeth. That's the ratio, right? Now, the number of teeth, the minimum is 12. So we at least have to multiply each one of these by 12 to find out the number of teeth. So let's see what we do. So let's take the first choice, 6 to 1, 6 to 1, and 5 to 1. And instead of going with 12, we're going to restrict ourselves to opinions with 14 teeth. Why 14 instead of 12? Maybe 14, we're using it in another product. So we already have a lot of uh, pinions around or, or small gears around with 14 teeth. So 14th on the pinion, 
times 6 gives us 84 on the gear. So 84 on the big gear, 14 on the small gear. 84 on the big gear, 14 on the small gear for the second set. And on that last set, that 5 to 1 set, 70 on the gear and 14 on the pinion. And so that gives us an exactly 180 to 1. So 14 to 84, 14 to 84 teeth, and again 14 to 70 teeth, giving us an exact ratio of 180. So how do you know which one you want to use? Do you use the one that gave us an approximate value or the one that gave us an exact value? It's just going to be dependent upon the problem. If somebody just says give, give us an exact ratio, then you need to factor. If someone says that some error is allowed, then they're saying don't give us an exact ratio. Give us something that is close. Okay. Now, the reverted compound train, a little different. We can construct a gear train with input and output shafts in different locations or in the same location, which means they're called linear or concentric shafts. The latter is called a reverted gear train. And so here's an example of that where our input shaft is collinear with our output shaft. So it's still a compound train, right? So you have your input, then your output, right, of the first set. And then this next input is on the same shaft with the first output, and it becomes the input to this final output. So the radiuses become important in this case because this input radius and this output has got to be equal to this input plus this output, right? So you end up with this collinear shaft situation. So how do we determine that? Okay, so this adds an additional constraint on the gears. The center to center distances have to be equal. So assuming the same diametral pitch, that means that if the radiuses are the same in terms of this equation, then the gear teeth can be represented by that same uh, equation. So instead of R2 plus R3 equals R4 plus R5, we can say the number of teeth on the second gear, right, equal the number of teeth on the third gear, equal the number of teeth on gear four, equal plus the number of teeth on gear five. Okay, so let's do that. Let's, let's, I'm going to show you now how to design, in this case, an exact 14.4 to 1 ratio, okay, but we're going to use a reverted compound train, 14.4. That's weird, right? So we're not doing 15, we're not doing 180, we're not doing 3 to 1, we're not doing a simple number, we have a 14.4, so let's see how that works. First, we need to find the factors that provide this ratio because, again, we're doing exact, which means we need to do factors. Now, the square root of 14.4 gives us 3.79, meaning, since it's less than 10, we know we can do this with just two gear sets. Okay, Remember, the first step you do is you take your number, where there was 180, in this case it's 14.4, you take the square root, you take the cube root, and you keep going until you find a number that's less than 10, in this case, the square root gives us 3.79 so we can proceed. Now, we're not likely to get some number times 3.79 to be an exact integer, because remember, we need an exact 14.4 to 1, so we got to factor, so this is where we start. To factor this number, 14.4 to 1, we're going to multiply by 10 to get 144 divided by 10, okay? So that's what we do when we have like a decimal. We multiply to get rid of that decimal, but then we divide by it to make sure that we still are working with the same number, 14.4. Now, if we factor the numerator and the denominator, this is what we get, right? And so we had a two, an extra two up here and an extra two in denominator, which canceled, okay? And so we still need to do the same thing we did before. We got to form two gear sets because remember, 14.4, the square root of it was less than 10. So we got to take all these numbers and form two gear sets from it. So let's try the ratio of 18 to 5 and 4 to 1. Now, 18 to, 5, 18 to 6 would be 3. So 18 to 5 is bigger than 3, and 4 to 1 is 4 to 1. So these ratios are kind of similar, so it's not a bad choice. But let's look and see how they got this. 18 to 5 would be 3 times 2, that's 6, times 3. That's the 18 divided by 5, and what's left? 4 over 1, okay? So you're breaking this up accordingly, right? And so those are the ratios that we're going to go with. They're close numerically. Now, we're going to assign factors to the gear sets. This is how we proceed. The first input gear, N2, this one, divided by N3 equals 5 over 18. Notice the smaller number of teeth is in the numerator because this is a smaller this is a smaller number, a smaller gear, 
so less teeth, so 5 over 18. And the next input over output is N4 over N5, 1 over 4, right? And so we have our two sets. Remember, we said we were going to be dealing with an 18 to 5 and a 4 to 1. And so over here, we have 5 and 18, 1 and 4. Remember, the smaller number goes in the numerator, okay? Then we rearrange so that the, new, the denominator is by itself. So N3 equals 18 over 5 times N2. And for this equation, N5 equals 4 times N4. You're just multiplying N5 across and the 4 across to get N5 by itself. Okay, so now we know that since this is a compound reverted train, N2 must plus N3 has got to be equal to N4 plus N5. Okay, so we're going to set each side equal to K. So N2 plus N3 is equal to K, and N4 plus N5 is equal to K. Okay, now rearrange. We already found on our previous slide that N3 was equal to 18 over 5 times N2. So let's replace this N3 with 18 over 5 times N2. But we know that's equal to K. Okay, so when we add these together, N2 plus 18 over 5 N2, we get 23 over 5 N2. Now, for the second equation, N4 plus N5 equals K. On the previous slide, we found that N5 was equal to 4 N4. So here, where we have N5, we're going to replace it with 4 N4. So N4 plus 4 N4 equals K, or K is equal to 5 N4. Okay. Now, these two equations are equal, right? They're both equal to K. And so if we go over here, we find that if we divide both of them, so this equation divided by this one, we get 1 on the left-hand side equal sign equal to 23 over 25 N2 over N4. Okay. So how do we, what do we do? What do we pick for N2 and N4 so that this equation, the right-hand side, equals 1? Right? Well, we could say that N2 is equal to 25 and N4 is equal to 23. And so that's what we have, right? We have a, the first input gear is equal to 25, this 25 teeth. The second input gear in 4 has 23 teeth. And if we go back to our equations, we'll find that in 3, in equation 1, must be equal to 90. And in 5, must be equal to 92 teeth. Okay? And so if we do this gear set where in 2 and in 3 and 4 and in 5 are as follows, Right? I'm sorry. With this number of teeth, 25, 23, 90, and 92, we will have an exact reverted compound gear train with a ratio of 14.4 to 1. If it turns out that N2 and N4 are too small, we could increase both by a common factor to get acceptable values. We could also use additional gear sets to get better numbers. For non-integer train ratios, for example, 17.21 to 1, it is usually more difficult to find a set of tooth numbers to give an exact ratio. Again, in this case, we'd multiply and end up with 1,721, and then try to factor that, okay? But it's going to be difficult, okay? Now, if we want an irrational ratio, let's say pi to 1, we may have to settle for the closest approximation for a given uh, package size. There are algorithms and programs that allow tables of possible solutions for a given error criterion for two and three stage gear trains. You can see those in your book. These can also be modified to handle reverted trains as well. Also, you can see that in your book. And that's the conclusion of gear trains in chapter nine. Thank you very much for listening.